Uh, today, the first presentation are regarding uh, uh, biosimilars in emerging markets. Uh, well, regarding biosimilars, there are very different situations. There is very Let's say that we can talk about three different scenarios. Uh, if we think about uh, countries under development, uh, Europe, considering, for example, the top EU5, or the US and other uh, developed systems. Um, coming to the countries under development, uh, we can, uh, until now at least, has been a less strict regulation. Um, the fact is, as we will see later, uh, only high level income population can uh, have access to the products. So the biosimilars will have a high impact in patients uh, access in patient access to the market. Uh, that is a totally different situation in Europe, for example, because uh, in general, uh, most of the cases, uh, the, any, anybody who will need a bio, biological product will receive the, this product in spite of the price. Uh, will be the, the, co the governments through taxes and insurances, uh, mandatory insurances uh, who will get the, 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 the payment of the, of the products. Uh, that is also the driving to a, what is called a nocebo effect. Uh, that is, some patients have been changed to a biosimilar, uh, can think that everything negative that happens is because of the biosimilar uh, intake. Of course, the situation between uh, Europe and emerging markets, for example, is quite different. Uh, and, the, and the role of the biosimilars in one and the other case is totally different. Um, we should try to understand what is the uh, definition of uh, sustainability for biosimilars marketplace. We should uh, consider all the things that are involved here, and patient access, the prescription uh, freedom, the health care budgets, um, the supply, uh, for sure, uh, level of competition, uh, the needs of, in general, all the stakeholders. And what is more important is don't forget that we are talking with uh, about a very complex uh, products. So quality, uh, to be sure that the highest quality standards is available is also quite important. Uh, if we come to the to the figures, that that this slide shows the big difference uh, that we can see in the intake of uh, bio, bio, biological products in the different markets. Uh, we have taken uh, US market and Germany as a comparator, comparators with the um, BRICS, and in this case, China, Brazil, Russia, and India. And we took only some of the molecules. I mean, those that were there are biosimil biosimilars available in the markets. That means if we get all the biologics, it will be the difference will be even uh, higher. And here, this we have done also this, uh, this, um, sorry, this uh, com comparison uh, taking Germany as the standard of care. What it means that uh, we take the, uh, as if Germany uh, number of units sold of the of these molecules uh, should be the standard. And uh, we see here the rest of the of the markets. What it means, for example, uh, the most the most approached uh, country that is Turkey uh, has 52 percent of the units that have uh, the uh, the um, Germany compared with the same population. And so it's still nearly 48 percent uh, of let's say um, a deficit of. Uh, treatments in, the, in, the, in this, in this uh, group of molecules. And this is the best one, but just come to Colombia, India, Brazil, or Chile, where the, the, the figures are quite, quite low. So it shows that the incredible um, uh, and this absolutely unfair situation for these markets. Regarding the average prices, uh, and again, a comparison with Germany, uh, as we see, uh, some markets like Thailand still have a very high price compared with Germany. That could be probably one of the reasons of this uh, low intake. But even in other markets uh, that are, uh, let's say, with prices low, uh, still the, the access to the, to, the, to the products is quite, quite low. 
No, I will not discuss very in detail uh, these figures, just only uh, give an idea of, uh, for example, the, the prices, the average prices between different markets. Again, we see like uh, they are not so different compared with the, with the probably the, the GDP average in, in, the, in, in, in them, you know. Another interesting thing I would like to show is uh, that um, uh, more than one third of the companies that are developing uh, biosimilars in the in the market in the in the world, nearly 33 percent, uh, sorry, 35 percent, come from three Asian markets: China, India, and Korea. So it's really clearly uh, one opportunity that we have to 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 discuss. Uh, it's an opportunity for this uh, part of the of the globe uh, for growing, for providing products that can help to uh, fill the gap that actually is uh, at the moment is quite quite important. Um, coming to the biggest markets in in, in Asia Pacific and also in the, in the emerging markets, uh, uh, we compare China and India. There are so big differences in in, in, the, in the average uh, price. I mean, nearly China has double price, but also. Uh, what is quite important is uh, you see that the units that are selling uh, in, the, in one case and the other, um, the difference is more or less four times, while in terms of prices is more or less eight times. That's quite, quite important. And it also can be explained because if you see uh, below the number of uh, products uh, available, uh, we see clearly that India has nearly all the products in, in a local basis, but this, all, these products are available in the market while in China the things are not the same. Uh, this situation will, is expected to be changing in the future as uh, the Chinese authorities are trying to, to boost uh, the use of this uh, or the, the, the production of these uh, uh, biosimilars and also uh, will be benefit because probably by um, launching these products in China, they will also be able to sell in the rest of the world. So we can expect and we, can, we are expecting a, a lot of new launches from these countries uh, from this, uh, country in the future. About MENA, we see that the situation is also very, very different. Uh, here, uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, it's, a big, uh, it's, it's the country where it's closer to Germany in terms of the average price. Uh, uh, but again, uh, still big differences can be uh, seen. Uh, about Latin America, I think Eduardo later will explain much better than me what, what's the situation there. Uh, there are some big differences. We don't forget. We should not forget that uh, Argentina and Brazil are the uh, manufacturers of, uh, of uh, and, uh, and developers of biosimilars, but can also affect uh, in why they are so in a little bit in a very slightly different situation than the rest of the markets. Uh, we evaluate in a, uh, as an example the situation in in Turkish in Turkish market. In order to understand what is the uh, impact of the biosimilars in, 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 in the intake of, uh, of, of, the, of the biosimilar or, or sorry of the molecule, and what is the uh, adoption curve that can be seen? And so, after three years, uh, more or less, uh, in this group of, of, of molecules that we are discussing, 35% of the of the whole are in, in biosimilars. Considering that some of them are very old. Uh, the fact that 65% of the of the of the market still in in, in the terms uh, is quite inter quite interesting. I mean, uh, the question here is that the originals are able to keep it, but at the cost to reduce by 25, 23, uh, 25 to 30% the prices. And uh, okay, this is the situation of infliximab. That is the only uh, uh, product that has um, uh, uh, the only anti TNF that has. Um, uh, have biosimilars in the market. So after three years, biosimilars uh, are 18.5% of the market. Um, <clears throat> coming to uh, some important uh, things that we should not forget is that we are talking about patients and uh, some of the treatments uh, that uh, this biosimilar are bringing, especially the, uh, those products that are treating uh, anti-immune uh, diseases, have a big impact in the in the quality of life of the people living in the emerging markets. So in summary, while in most of the developed markets, uh, let's say the biosimilars are trying to, can help the health authorities to, 
to keep the budget under, under uh, control, but uh, in fact, uh, directly, no, uh, they are not affecting directly in the daylight, uh, the daytime at the moment. Uh, the availability of the treatment for the protection in emerging markets, the situation is totally different. So we should not forget this one. Uh, I think this is a matter is not only a matter of uh, of uh, figures. It's not only a matter of um, it's not a matter only of uh, of, of uh, money. It's a matter of people. So I think we should work together uh, in and trying to bring. Uh, the best possible uh, options, a therapeutic option, to as many people as possible. And uh, biosimilars should be a key uh, tool in this, uh, in this uh, objective. So uh, we should try to find ways to make them available as soon, as fast, and as sustainable as possible. And now I would like to, uh, like to, to, give, uh, to introduce uh, Philippe Gautron. He will be speaking about uh, the situation in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, so I prefer he introduce himself. Uh, I think it's going to be much more, much more effective. So please, uh, Philippe, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. And oh, well, that's, that's it. OK, thanks, uh, Ignacio. So uh, hello to all the viewers, all the participants. Uh, I'm Philippe, so I'm a, I'm a French uh, national and uh, I've been in the biopharma industry for uh, 22 years now. Uh, I've been in Asia um, 18 years uh, this year. Uh, I was in a big pharma company setting up affiliates in the region. I've been also working in uh, uh, the, uh, non the original business, the generic business. And now I work uh, for uh, DKSH, which, which is the largest uh, market expansion uh, service company in healthcare in, uh, in this continent. And uh, I'm leading the effort in terms of BD, and I'm also marketing head for the on brands division. And uh, what is uh, relevant to our topic today is uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, as a company who is trying to acquire a biosimilar because we are not a developer. Uh, and so with my team, we've been digging into this topic uh, for uh, quite uh, some time. We have already achieved some success by uh, um, uh, snapping up some, some deals uh, last year. Uh, for myself, I am a sports guy, so uh, I enjoy a lot being in Thailand uh, because I'm calling you from uh, that country uh, because I can uh, do a lot of uh, triathlon, trail and uh, adventure races. So um, let's start with the presentation. Okay, I think it's good. So uh, I started with a question that uh, you uh, will have a little bit more elements to answer by yourself at the end. Is biosimilar blue ocean in uh, Asia Pacific? Uh, so because you will see there are really uh, pros and cons, uh, very attractive things, but also uh, quite uh, some uh, uh, difficulties and hurdles uh, of this very particular uh, environment. Um, I'm going to uh, explain you most of, uh, of uh, the data and our experience uh, with my team that we had uh, during this journey of learning about biosimilar uh, from the perspective of uh, North Asia. Asia. So it means that uh, we will not talk about China and Japan because uh, for uh, corporate reason, my company is not covering those two uh, markets, uh, though very important, but we have been really uh, then uh, uh, digging and um, discussing the topic of biosimilar for all the rest of the market we've covered. So uh, let's start with a, a view of the uh, Southeast Asia biosimilar market. Uh, this is uh, a market that uh, is really growing uh, much more than the usual pharma market. Uh, now we are achieving, I think, uh, in the year 2020, we are around a billion uh, dollar, and it's set to be a 1.4. So uh, basically, it's going to uh, produce a CAGR of uh, 14, 15 percent over the next two, three years. Uh, the diabetes insulin product are the main piece of the cake, but uh, they are uh, well followed by uh, oncology and uh, immunology uh, products. In terms of uh, total picture of the market. Uh, so, uh, including Southeast Asia, but also including uh, the North Asian countries. 
uh, this is what we can see. So the total former business market is more or less 50 billion. You can see that uh, Korea has a very big share of it. Um, and then when we look at what is the biologic market, so by biologic, I mean biological original brand plus the biosimilar, uh, we see that uh, more or less uh, the market is about uh, a billion uh, dollar uh, for uh, that uh, market. Uh, on top of the uh, 50 percent, uh, 50 billion dollars. So you can see that it's about a two, three percent uh, share of the total uh, market. Right now, the biosimilar uh, penetration is about uh, 25 to 30 percent uh, of the market. It depends on the country. Some have much higher penetration, like Indonesia, where they're really pushing the, to lower the cost, and uh, some are still very low. Uh, we will see the particularities. Uh, with, uh, for example, uh, Singapore and Thailand market. So uh, this biosimilar, of course, uh, now should be very well uh, seen and welcome uh, instead uh, of uh, original uh, biologics uh, due to the cost. And uh, uh, we all know that the, the Asia is a developing countries uh, with a lower uh, um, level uh, of uh, living for uh, government, but also for individuals. So of course, uh, this, is a, this is a key point. Let's have a look at the uh, share of uh, what is reimbursed and what is out of pocket. So here clearly we see uh, two different type of group. You have the uh, group of North Asia like uh, Hong Kong, Korea and Taiwan where the states with the social security system makes the, is the payer uh, by tax uh, and uh, discount uh, on salaries uh, as Ignacio presented before and uh, they cover uh, the expenses so the product are for free. For the rest of the country, which are Southeast Asian countries, uh, most of it, uh, uh, for most of it, the people have to pay out of pocket. So really by cash, they have to pay the treatment or they have to pay their own private uh, insurance. So uh, this is, of course, uh, the cost, the cost opportunity uh, to decrease, uh, uh, to decrease the cost and to expand uh, the volume of patients to be treated with these uh, novel therapeutics is a uh, very uh, uh, interesting in these markets. In terms of regulation, the government in Southeast Asia, they try, but step by step to uh, really open the door and to really uh, make a, a better uh, entry proposal uh, to biosimilar. So first, uh, they may uh, implement some uh, fast track uh, list for biosimilar uh, in Thailand. Uh, in Vietnam, they impose as well, uh, potentially they can agree on a very specific case when the product is very uh, well uh, needed in emergency, they can offer a quota of importation. So it means that you can launch the product without having a properly um, approved. Uh, countries like Vietnam and Malaysia are also trying to do a, a classic scheme that is done in MENA is to, to uh, favor a local investment for the manufacturing of uh, biosimilars and then to offer, of course, fast track registration or a better pricing in, uh, in counterparts. Uh, clinical trial are also uh, uh, required some, in some countries, but I would say that if you come with a, a European dossier with a clinics made uh, uh, up to the European standard, there is no uh, additional request uh, most of the time in terms of uh, clinical trial. So for me, uh, to give uh, you uh, a lot of um, uh, very concrete input, uh, it's to talk about the re regulatory, because this is uh, the key bottleneck uh, of this category right now uh, to be more developed uh, in Asia. And uh, for those who don't know Asia, Asia is simply a complicated uh, uh, continent in terms of regulatory because it's not like Europe who is fully harmonized with one guideline for one kind of product. Here it's completely uh, up to the countries and they have their own regulation and, uh, and uh, desire or needs. So if you want to find a partner, you need to find a partner. If you wish to go on a regional, uh, on a regional uh, expansion, you need to have somebody uh, up to uh, the task to really understand the particularities of the countries. Uh, the definition of the biosimilar is the same similarity. One thing is very important and I, ex I experienced myself is the, the comparability uh, of the uh, reference uh, biological product has to be from the same manufacturing. Uh, Asian countries are very, very picky about that. So for example, I give you uh, uh, an example. I was working on a dossier, the, the, the product in Asia, the original product is uh, made uh, in Japan. 
but the, the, the partner made the study against the product who was the factory made uh, in uh, France. So at the end, we had to finally uh, obtain a, a, a study, comparability study of the two products uh, with the French one and the Japanese one uh, regarding the biologic uh, products. So those are complications that we often see and you need to uh, be uh, aware uh, of that. Also, uh, compar co quality comparable data are requested not only for the finished product, but also for the active uh, substance, which is sometimes uh, surprising uh, some uh, partner as well. In terms of guidelines, so um, I would say biosimilar is a topic that is pretty new in Asia. So uh, you had very few countries who had guidelines developed uh, nationally. Uh, one of the first one was uh, Hong Kong and, and Taiwan. And now it has been followed up uh, with Korea, Malaysia and Philippines, uh, Singapore. But still, I would say that their guidelines are uh, copy pasting most of the European guidelines uh, for some of them. Korea is an example a bit particular. The industry, biosimilar industry is very strong there and they develop the product uh, their own way. So sometimes it's also a difficulty for them to go abroad. Right now we can see only one or two company from Korea to really be, to really be successful uh, outside uh, uh, their, their own market. Thailand is a specific example. Thailand has a list of products that they are on the biosi biosimilar list. This list is very uh, specific, subjective. And if you are out of the list, then you are considered as a new biologic and you need to provide uh, the complete full dossier. So this is, uh, I give you an example. I was working on a product that you all may know. It's a teriparatide, uh, Forteo from uh, Eli Lilly. So in Europe, uh, this is not uh, biosimilar because this is a very short, uh, chain of peptide and Europe thinks that below 34 uh, peptides, then it's not a biosimilar. Thailand see it completely different and see it as a uh, biologic. So you may have company, uh, they want to come to Thailand bringing and uh, trying their dossier, but they have just the phase one, which was just the one uh, accepted in the EU uh, submission, but uh, Thailand will require a phase three. So you can imagine uh, that's a major uh, bug uh, to, uh, to uh, submit your dossier successfully. Uh, other markets uh, like Vietnam are seeing uh, more like the biological, they want the same type of package for biosimilar and other, the small, very small market, which are uh, non-developed like Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar, they just uh, have no guidelines on biosimilar and they see it as a new drug, uh, small molecules that you have to bring in uh, uh, to, their, uh, to their registration uh, authorities. In terms of uh, approval, so uh, one thing uh, that is very important to know is Asia market will ask for CPPs from Europe or ICH top 10 countries. So it means that they are all the time waiting that the biosimilar is approved somewhere uh, before uh, accepting the submission. And I'm talking about submission of the dossier, not the approval. Uh, Taiwan is a, is a, is a key, key example. They require minimum two CPP. So uh, to go uh, to Taiwan, you need to have an EU approved product, to have a product uh, approved uh, uh, in Europe and in US, for example, uh, to have a chance to submit successfully. Uh, one other uh, point that I, I, I want to highlight on that slide is, for example, um, Hong Kong, the reference uh, biological product has to be already registered for over eight years before you can launch I mean launch, the biosimilar. So it's a kind of also a protection uh, that uh, the country is uh, offering to the originator uh, companies. Uh, this is independent of data exclusivity or patent. So CPP has to be marketed. So you have to prove that you have launched the product uh, in the area. The non-clinical uh, part is uh, quite classic. Clinical part phase one and phase three is demanded. Uh, we see sometimes that risk management plan is an issue to, to ask to a partner. Uh, and uh, one very funny uh, last uh, point is uh, product sample. Countries like Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, they will act effectively to have the real sample, commercial sample, already ready with the artworks, final uh, approval artworks, uh, to show them uh, for accepting the submission. Uh, the reason is uh, it took me so many years to understand that. Uh, being a Westerner, but uh, in, in Asia, uh, the reason is that uh, they want to be sure that you're going to make a submission with the intention to launch the product. So they want to have already a uh, uh, concrete step of you are going to effectively launch the product and they are not going to work for nothing on a registration and use resources. 
Let's talk about the commercial, uh, how uh, those products are already uh, seen in terms of uh, commercial and, uh, and wool. So uh, again, we have two types of groups. We have the group of Singapore, Malaysia, and Kong. This is pure tender. This is close to, uh, very close to the situation we have in Europe, especially in uh, Scandinavia and countries like that. Uh, uh, you have a bidding, uh, you are bidding on a specification and of course bidding on price. The winner will win all the volume that is guaranteed by the government. And this usually for two years, for example, Hong Kong, this is definitely two years. The price of the biosimilar can be really uh, low, it can start really 50, 60 or even 40% sometimes from uh, uh, the originator price uh, in order to have a chance. So for those markets, launching a biosimilar is not very demanding in terms of field force, uh, medical reps, and um, marketing uh, activities and resources. It's not very intense, it's quite easy. Uh, for Thailand, Vietnam, Taiwan, Korea, and Philippines, you register your product, but then you have to register your product in all the key hospitals. So it's a listing one by one. So for example, uh, let's talk about Thailand. You have, a, let's say, I would say, um, 70 hospitals that they would be really relevant for a biosimilar prescription. Uh, of course, uh, a medical school hospital, then you have the province hospital and then the city hospital. Uh, you will need to list your product one by one. So it means that you have to convince the therapeutical or pharmaceutical committee, you have to negotiate the price with the pharmacist uh, in chief of the hospital. So it's a free price competition because in fact, it's a B2B discussion. Uh, uh, the pharmacist will have the reference of the other uh, price uh, maybe to uh, negotiate with you. Usually uh, first biosimilar would start at 60% uh, or 50% in some uh, cases for uh, older, older uh, products. There is no rules of substitution, but in practice, uh, of course, uh, the pharmacies in some markets are very powerful and they manage the budget uh, of the hospital. So uh, they would uh, be entitled if the doctor is not super strong on the prescription for non-substitution message uh, to uh, switch to a biosimilar. But as, I, I, as you can see, because of the listing and the promotion, because you can be only, we can be one biosimilar, two biosimilar, uh, three biosimilar and the originator on the same market. This is very intense in terms of market resource uh, and a uh, field force resource. So uh, uh, if you have partner and they ask you for a certain margin, uh, this, is, uh, this is mainly the reason. So uh, I think you, you've seen that the uh, opportunity is there. The total market is uh, really, really small compared to the, to the total uh, biosimilar market. So there is a growth, there is appetite, but still regulation is a key point and uh, uh, is, a, is a something that needs to be very uh, carefully uh, um, viewed before in due diligence and discussion with your partner. I think that's done for me. So thank you very much, uh, Philippe. Uh, it has been a very interesting uh, presentation and introduction. Uh, now I would like to have, have have a question here because what you mentioned is there are a lot of um, let's say hidden and non-hidden barriers to go there, but in your opinion, what is would be the three bottlenecks for a company who wants to to to, to go there with uh, biosimilars to the market? So uh, yeah, the, the registration is uh, is the is the is the key point first uh, for for the first reason is. Um, uh, the region is not harmonized at all, so you need to have uh, resources to develop a dossier and a documentation that they are uh, meeting the various needs of the country, and they are very uh, uh, different. Uh, they, they may have a common body, but then uh, it's just uh, uh, maybe there's still 15%, 20% that is uh, really uh, up uh, and uh, ad hoc to each country. Uh, the second one is... Uh, the CPP. I think uh, the key message here is uh, very, very few markets and the most important one in Asia will accept only product when they have been uh, vetted and they are launched in very uh, high re reference markets. So they want a marketed CPP from key reference countries. So of course, um, the launch is all the time two, three years after uh, a European uh, biosimilar launch the Asia launch will happen only two, three years after at the best. This is what we do in our own planning uh, in DKSH. Uh, the, the, the third part is, I would say, um, the, 
the opportunity is nice, the, the numbers will grow, there is an appetite, the population is there, uh, but also still uh, when a company has to evaluate discussing with a partner in Asia, the total of the region is only 2-3% uh, in pharma or in biosimilar market. Uh, so uh, there is all the time a question from the partner, uh, well, uh, should I really mobilize a lot of resources in regulation and in BD and alliance for this small market, whereas we need to still finalize our strategy in Europe, Japan or US. So this is also what I see from my side when I contact companies, uh, we are not all the time on the top, uh, top of the list of their, uh, of their um, uh, projects uh, for the year. So that's why also it's uh, one of the things that's slowing down the entry of more biosimilar uh, right now. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's quite interesting uh, what you're uh, discussing here. And if, for example, a company uh, would try to, to get uh, to go inside, you, you, you had mentioned in about three years in advance uh, to prepare themselves to go there. Uh, what should be, the, in, in your opinion, the, the steps they should follow in this, in this approach? Well, the, if you want to go to Asia, you have to, to be sure that you are going uh, before with the relevant markets where uh, they, they will obtain CPP. So that's the, that's the, key, the key part. Uh, so you need to, uh, to map out the entry of Asia after uh, entry of high regulated market like Europe or US. Uh, otherwise, they, this is all the time a, a blocking point. Uh, the, the, the second thing is uh, you have to uh, decide do you want to go regional or you want to go local? Uh, regional, you need really a partner to have uh, a really uh, broadened view and very high uh, registration uh, capacity and good experience in biosimilar. Usually, well, our group, we have it, or other companies have it now. Uh, I think this is really a division in a regulatory that has been uh, uh, where everybody has put more effort to understand the guidelines and discuss with potential partners. So this is the, really uh, a key part uh, for, for the choice. Uh, the, the, the third one is, would, I would say, is to carefully evaluate uh, the competition um, uh, and the ambition. Right now, I can share with you, I was looking at um, uh, what is the performance of uh, what I would call the, the wave two biosimilar uh, so the product, the biosimilar on etanercept, uh, bevacizumab, rituximab, infliximab, trastuzumab. Uh, when you are first, you can expect from what we see from the market to achieve between 30% uh, percent of the market uh, to uh, 5% if you are in your one. 30% uh, if you are uh, in your uh, four. Uh, if you are second already, it's going down to maybe max 12% after your four to uh, 1% in your one. So, uh, of course, speed uh, is, a, is, a, is, a key, is a key point here. And, of course, the way you will build up your dossier uh, to uh, achieve a, a sooner market launch date is very, very important. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philippe. It has been really interesting uh, speech. And uh, I think, at least for me, it has been very com complete uh, overall of the situation in uh, Asia Pacific, especially in the countries and the markets that you have your expertise. And so, uh, well, I, I think this time now to, to move to the next uh, speaker at the moment, since uh, Eduardo Chiopi, as he is, will speak now about uh, the situation in Latin America that is uh, completely different. Uh, also, I would like him to introduce himself. Uh, I think it's the best way. And uh, well, uh, Eduardo is your your, your turn on at the moment. Okay, Jose, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here and sharing this, uh, this session with you all. And just to introduce myself, my name is Eduardo Siopi. I'm based currently in Buenos Aires in Argentina. I have been working for the pharmaceutical industry for the last 25, 30 years. Um, so, uh, having experience in biosimilar for the last 10 years in, in, in a couple of companies. I'm currently having the, the responsibility of being the regional director uh, in Latin America for Map Science. Map Science is a company based in Spain. Um, the headquarters is, are in Spain, and we are part of the Insul Pharma Group, formerly uh, known as the Chemo Group. We have uh, three facilities, two facilities in, in Buenos Aires, in, in Argentina, and the third one in, in Leon, in, in Spain, in the north of Madrid. 
So we have been working for the last 10 years in developing and manufacturing and, and commercializing biosimilars at the global level. Um, we have started our operations initially in Argentina uh, and in Spain, and we have been for the last decade uh, uh, expanding in Latin America and Southeast Asia and, and, and currently uh, in, in the exciting venture of uh, trying to enter into high regulated markets. Um, I'm a chemist. Um, I have been studying for a lot of uh, years in the in the pharma and, and, and just uh, once I finished my college, I, I, I joined the pharma industry. And, and as a hobby, uh, I, I used to, to play golf when I was younger. And so let's see if we, uh, if we can start with the presentation. I hope it will be um, interesting for you. So the idea is to go to the uh, Latin American uh, situation of the biosimilars. And let's see if the, okay. So the idea of this presentation is to go from the, from the global to the regional, trying to understand how uh, Latin America has been evolving in the last decade in the, in the biosimilar field. So this is the, the short agenda from the global perspective to the regional perspective, and then try to, to talk about the, the key topics that we are uh, used to talk or to speak when talking about biosimilars. So let's see, let's go through the, through the presentation itself. So from a global perspective, we know that the global market, the global farm market will be reaching 1.5 billion in a couple of years. So it's still growing in, in spite of the COVID-19 situation, we have been identifying that the market farm, the market farm will be keep on growing. And, and mainly the drivers will be the same as usual, US, Japan, and EU5, but also Latin America has been a region that has been growing steadily in the last, in the last years. So the biological products have been growing steadily in the, in the last years. We know that uh, biologicals are representing 25% of the global sales, but uh, only 5% in terms of units. So this is why uh, we usually talk about the uh, high cost or uh, high price uh, products. Um, but in spite of having 25% of uh, biological products as a global piece of cake, only 1% are, are coming from biosimilars. So I think that we, we considering this figure, we have a couple of outputs. And the first one is that a biosimilar has still room to grow uh, at the global level. And, and the second one is that the biosimilar has uh, became a need for all the health systems because the affordability and the access has been identified as one of the key uh, issues that all the health insurance systems have uh, at the global level. So this is why I mentioned that biosimilars uh, had the, the development of biosimilars has been becoming global. And so the new, the new, the new term as emerging biopharma uh, means that the universe of biopharma companies is diverse. Uh, and these emerging biopharma companies are coming precisely for these countries that are being displayed in the, in the slide. So uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly, Argentina and Brazil are among the top 10 biosimilars development. So among China, India, Korea, we have mentioned before, uh, as my colleagues have, have mentioned, Argentina and Brazil are being part of the biosimilar landscape. So the, the first con the conclusion is that finally the biosimilar has been uh, entering into the, into the, into the, the global pharma market um, and mainly driven by emerging biopharma companies. And Latin, Latin America has been also developing their own biosimilar industry. The second one is related to the global expenditure in biosimilars. Um, we, we, in, the last, in the last year, we have been uh, researching and, and, and trying to, to, to identify which are the drivers for, for the savings. And we realized that the biosimilars are directly related to savings, uh, both for patients and also for the health systems. And close to 100,000 million dollars will be uh, defined as savings by this year or next year. So the, for the patients and, and for the access of them, biosimilar have finally become a reality. Um, I, I think that the, for, for emerging markets, uh, as Philippe mentioned, and, and, and also in Latin America, for, the, for emerging markets, uh, I think that, that there is still room to growth, especially in, the, in regions where the, the coverage is still, is still low. As you, as, you, as you can see here, uh, and according to the uh, recent IQVIA data, Latin America is still about the average in terms of growth. 
So um, considering the United States, the EU5, Japan, and the, and the, and the worldwide as, a, as, a, as an average, still in farm emerging markets, the average of growth is still uh, above the, the rest of the, of the regions. So it means that there is still room to, to keep on growing in the, in the biosimilar uh, market in, in, in this region. As a second conclusion, Biosimilars have been entering or have been given savings of about 100,000 million expected for this year and next year. And in Latin America, as an average, uh, the, the growth is slightly above the rest of the, of the regions. So for companies that are entering into the Latin America, I think that Latin America is quite the challenging region to enter with, with biosimilars. The third one, the third part is uh, how is the uptake in Latin America? And when, when we analyze all the, all the different products that have been reaching the market, we uh, understand that uh, as, as, as the new developments appear on the, on the stage, the, the average time the, for the uptake is becoming less. So uh, if you compare in this, in this graph, uh, the, the first one which was probably rituximab and the last one that may be adalimumab, uh, you can see that the uptake has been quite fast in, the, in, in terms of the, the, the recent developments. So the uptake or the, uh, the adoption of biosimilars has been re re increasing in the, in the last at least five years. So the uptake may change or may be different from country to country, uh, but we believe that the challenge is still to continue and to keep a regulatory environment and guidelines that will be focused in increasing patient access. We, uh, we at Mark Science that have been working for, um, for manufacturing and uh, biosimilar for a decade, we identify the access as one of the issues that the health system has to understand to open the doors to biosimilars and also to the physicians that needs to understand that biosimilars is a reality and is really the linked to the, to the access, especially for the patients. For the last 10 years, regulations in Latin America has been fostering the registration of biosimilars and the uptake has been uh, increasing steadily for the last five years. As you can see in, in this map, there are several biosimilars in, in different countries. Of course, this is not exhaustive because uh, every day appears new products, but you may see that there are several biosimilars of, for monoclonal, for rituximab, infliximal, trastuximab, and um, being Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, the drivers of the region. So the penetration of biosimilars in Latin America has been quite strong in the recent, in the recent five years. So the conclusion number three is the Latin America biosimilar market has been growing in the last decade. And, and the, the idea of the regulation is try to, to cover all the market and met needs. So, this part of the presentation is try to identify which will be the approach and the models to, to try to grant access for the patients to the biosimilars. So according to IQVIA, which is a very uh, interesting slide, the key aids for a successful introduction of biosimilar are probably a regulatory environment and clinical guidelines. So in this case, in Latin America, has been working towards an harmonization of the regulations in, in, in all the key countries. And talking about the product, about the, the safety, the quality, and the supply continuity, because most of the, uh, of the markets are tender markets, and we need to uh, uh, try to ensure the, the continuity of supply to, to these markets. Having incentives in case in, uh, for, for, for patients' uh, factors and also for pre, uh, prescribing incentivation. And of course, uh, one of the key aspects is the competitive pressure. The level of competition in Latin America has been growing in the, in the, in the last years and from the innovators and also from the biosimilars. So I think that is a, a kind of uh, interesting arena to, to dig and, and to identify which are the, the key drivers. So the sustainability improves the patient access and we have uh, very clear that the high quality of the products is a driver and that the doctors should be safe uh, and, and confident in prescribing biosimilars. And, and I think that the protecting the healthy level of competition will be uh, supporting the access of the patients. We have been traveling uh, for all, in, in all the region, in Mexico, in Colombia, Peru, Brazil, uh, even in Argentina. And, and there is a situation that there are, there are a lot of unmet needs that are still need to be covered. And we, uh, I, we believe 
that the adoption of a similar has been slightly different in the country, but uh, steadily growing uh, in, in, the, in the last years. So what about the countries, which is the, uh, a very uh, a snapshot of, of the countries. In Argentina, we have been uh, having a, a strong presence of local biotech companies. In fact, we have a Nobel Prize, which was the Dr. Cesar Milstein, who was the, the, the physician that discovered the monoclonal antibodies when working, uh, when working in UK. Uh, so the Argentinian government and, and has been always supporting the development and growth of local companies. And, and in fact, Map Science is, a, is an example of that. We have recently inaugurated in February the, the biggest uh, biosimilar fa facility in all the region. Um, and there is a continuous uh, cooperation between the public and the private sector, and especially with the university. So Argentina has been since mid 80s, uh, one of the countries that was the initial drivers for, for biosimilars. Um, Paraguay and Uruguay, uh, in spite of being smaller countries than Argentina, has been uh, supporting the, the, the increased uh, market of, of biosimilars, especially in Paraguay, where the tenders have been, it's a tender market, it's a 95% tender market, uh, and the MOH, the Minister of Health, has been supporting and fostering um, the, the tenders to reach a uh, decrease in, in prices. In fact, if you compare the prices in Argentina and in Paraguay and Uruguay, in Argentina, for example, when we appeared with Rituximab uh, six years ago, and uh, in dollars, the price of the product has been decreasing in close to 50%. But the, the, the increase of the, patient, of the patient population is close to 45, 50%. So it's directly related, the decrease in price, the access for more patients and much more people to be treated in these particular diseases. Chile and Bolivia are, uh, I think that both, both countries have still room to grow. Um, in Chile, still the private market is important. And for regulatory perspective, I think that Chile is one of the toughest markets in South America. And they are following very closely the, the regulations uh, of central markets. And sometimes it, it, I think that it should be, and uh, the time for re reaching the registration is quite long. So for us, uh, two years or, or more, to get the registration, uh, it, is, it is becoming a barrier for people to, to get access to the, to the products. Brazil is one of the regions of the, pan, of the countries that uh, has been shown, uh, showing us, uh, which is the support of the, of the local government to the, to the local industry. So to, to establish in Brazil, uh, you need to have a, a, a participation, a collaboration with the local company through a system uh, that is called PDP, where localization, localization intends to, to, to grant uh, or to try to, to, to foster the tech transfer to the local companies. Uh, if you succeed in the PDP system, you will be having access to the, to the, to the public market and being Max Science and Leaves, which is a Brazilian company, one of the examples of a successful cooperation. We have uh, entered with Rituximab last year uh, and, and now we are having uh, access to the public market uh, as part of this uh, tech transfer exchange uh, and, and trying to, of course, uh, supporting this uh, tech transfer situa situation, the local industries are uh, receiving technology, they're receiving knowledge, and at the end of the day, they are capable of manufacturing the products at the, at the local level. Peru and Ecuador are two countries that are example of a almost 100% tender market and this kind of like auction-like system for getting access to biologicals and biosimilars. Uh, and this system has granted to these two countries a, a really reduction in or achieving really low prices. So uh, several companies have been entering into both countries uh, and the price reduction in Peru and Ecuador has been really, really important and, and granting or giving access to much uh, more patients. Colombia, from a regulatory perspective, have been in Bima, their authority has been also uh, an example in the region. They have been one of the first countries that have identified uh, an abbreviated pathway for registering some kind of biosimilars. But on the opposite side, sometimes the process takes a couple of years, which is at the end of the day, balance uh, having a good regulatory landscape with having a, a, some, some long time to achieve the registration. And there are several several units. There are there are several small tenders, 
at the end the payer are the same, are the, are the government. But I think that Colombia is one of the countries that are an example for the rest of the Latin America in terms of regulation. But I think that for a commercial perspective, uh, they have still room to grow and the competition should be a, a little more over there. Mexico is one of the largest countries in terms of volume and their authority has been always an example of uh, having identified the regulations uh, uh, based on the central regulations. Recently, there has been some change in the, in the government and there are, they, they have appeared in the news because now they are just changing dramatically the way that they are purchasing the biosimilars. Uh, up, up, up to last year, they have a national tender, a couple of national tenders, and where you, can, you could be competing uh, on a price based. Uh, and now the government is having face-to-face -face discussion with the companies. If you're invited to this table for discussion, you can access the, the public market, which is the largest uh, compared with the private one. And I think that Mexico is one of the key markets that anyone that wants to enter into Latin America should be uh, have a, a deep focus on that. Venezuela and Central America have different tendering and purchasing system. Uh, especially in Central America, they, they are following uh, a centralized procedure like Comisca. Comisca is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an office that centralizes all the all the tenders. And, and they, in spite of having different way of, of purchasing biosimilar, they have their own uh, their own system, and I think that the market will be uh, keep on growing in the in the in the next years. Venezuela, the, I think that it's a it's a big market to 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 follow up. Um, the moment that they change the political situation, the, I think that once the market is open, it will be a, quite a, an interesting challenge uh, because there is a, a lot of amenities needs over there, and hopefully it will be solved soon. So as a conclusion, number four, Latin America has been adopting different approach for very similar haptic, and we believe that there are still room to, to grow. And, and finally, about talking about education as information as a pillar of success, um, because uh, we believe that um, the confidence of the physicians, the education, uh, in regards of safety and efficacy of similar are crucial to get the, uh, the uptake, are crucial to make the, the doctor feel comfortable for, for pres uh, prescribing uh, and for fostering the acceptance of biosimilar. The information to the population is also crucial because there are, the competition is quite tough and, uh, and we believe that the patients have the, the needs to, to cover all the the information to be safe. So we at Massize, we have been working a lot in, in, in doing spreading information in, in Latin America. And these are several examples and try to educate people, try to educate the, the, the doctors and try to support the, the health systems and, and what does biosimilar means in the market for, for getting access. So in summary, I think that the there is a robust biosimilar competition and that will be ensuring uh, sustainable biosimilar markets and we identify that the access and the, the patient's access is crucial and long-term sustainability and is, is also very important to be addressed and uh, there's still room to keep on growing and but uh, the final message is that we believe that the, the authorities when the authorities identify that the, having biosimilars in the, in the market uh, um, makes uh, or grants much more access to the patients, I think that at the end of the day, they have met the, uh, all, all the objectives that they have as, as, as health authorities. So this is the, regarding the presentation itself. And let's see if we can... Thank you very much, Eduardo. It has been a very compelling, very extensive, and very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I have shared two questions. Uh, first of, of them uh, is regarding the patients, uh, sorry, the physicians' uh, uh, opinion about, um, about the biosimilars in Latin America. Do you think that the, the fact that many local companies have been developing uh, is a positive or a negative, uh, have had a positive or a negative uh, impact in, in this uh, perception? Initially, there was a, uh, it not, it no, was not so positive at the, at the, at the beginning, because at the beginning, um, the competition uh, was uh, really tough, uh, and there was a claiming in the region that the biosimilar were products coming from, from bad quality. 
And fortunately, in the last years, uh, several companies, uh, as Map Science, as Sandos, as Samsung, Celtri, and there are several companies. And I'm not a, I'm not afraid of, of of naming these companies because they are they are they are manufacturing high quality products. Have entered into the region, um, and I think that now the physician has the enough information to prescribe. But at the beginning, let's say five seven years back, it was uh, very tough to to educate people because there was a confusion on the patients and, 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 and the doctors that biosimilar were not of a, a very good quality. Uh, at the moment, due to the, a lot of work that we have been doing along with our uh, other companies uh, in, in terms of education, finally, I think that the, the systems and the, mainly the, 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 the physicians understood which are the benefits of prescribing biosimilars. Just uh, yes, uh, have an, I would like to, to, to make you the same question that I did to Philippe. Uh, what are, in your opinion, the two or three bottlenecks for uh, the, um, the penetration of biosimilars in Latin America? Yeah, uh, I think that one of the bottlenecks was the, the lack of knowledge in, in, in terms of biosimilars. Because when you go through to the, to the, to the uh, leader countries, as I said, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia, there was a, a good knowledge in terms of regulation, and they have been the leaders uh, in, uh, and the ones that started the regulations uh, 10 years back. But when, if you go to the, um, to the smaller countries, um, the adoption of the, of, of, of the, of the guidelines um, and the knowledge and the information was one of the barriers. Uh, other barrier was the, the sometimes the miscommunication coming from from the originators when when trying to uh, get people sometimes afraid of being prescribed by similars and there has been a lot of news on articles uh, spread in the last uh, let's say by the beginning and I think that uh, initially the the knowledge and the information uh, was was crucial. We at Map Science we have decided that uh, all the, the the doors of our facility should be open to physicians, to patients associations, to authorities, then because the the more they know about, about biosimilars, if you are able to organize forums or to disclose information, to give confidence, uh, to open the doors to a facility, to see uh, how a facility is, which are the controls, how a, a, a high quality biosimilar is manufactured, I think that these bottlenecks have been uh, over, overpassed. Um, another one are, are the, the, the tender system. I think that uh, now in the recent years, the tender systems are uh, much more open and much more transparent. And I think that in the recent year, if you go through the key countries, biosimilar has finally entered and the price reduction was achieved. But initially, that uh, the, the transparency of the tender system was, uh, was an issue, uh, fortunately solved in the last two or three years. But I think that the regulations and the information has been initially the barrier that we have found, uh, fortunately overcome. Uh, and the moment that much more companies are coming into the region, and uh, it, it will be much more easy for the patients and for the physicians to get confidence that they are receiving or prescribing high quality products. Thank you very much uh, for your answers. It is quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, what you say about the, the tenders is quite interesting because the uh, next, uh, next, uh, speak is about uh, tenders in Europe and we will see uh, that uh, it's very important the way it's uh, organized uh, and it's a very key success factor for the uh, for the entry of uh, or the adoption of the biosimilars in the, in, in the markets so well I want to thank you very much you and Philippe uh, for this uh, I think very interesting uh, uh, session where we have uh, seen two of the most important areas in terms of uh, emerging markets in biosimilars. Uh, so, um, well, I would like to, to move to the European part of the session that is going to be uh, presented by me. Uh, that is uh, the, I would like to make first uh, the introduction to the Well, uh, this is the part of the, the, the session uh, regarding the European market. 
first question that we like to to emphasize here uh, is uh, that uh, I mentioned many times, very often in the in the last uh, articles that I've been published in the last uh, last months. Uh, that is very promising, but very expensive new drugs coming to the market. Uh, that is quite good for the for the expectation of the patients. As we see here, uh, only the 10 top products launched in 2019 are expected to, to bring about 20 billion US dollars in sales in 2024. Uh, if we go to the, specifically so to the growth segments, for example, in Germany, uh, coming from a survey made by, by ML Pharma last year, uh, nearly, uh, the, nearly one third of these were represented by biologic products and they were growing at an average of 40%, nearly 40%. So biosimilars are not an option, are a need in Europe. Otherwise, uh, the system can be really, really uh, compromised in the next years. We see more than 300 uh, medicines to treat uh, skin diseases, 1,000 uh, vaccines for cancer, uh, vaccine and products uh, for cancer, uh, immuno-oncology treatments, uh, the, all of them very expensive products, uh, unique products, uh, the last hope for many patients. But of course, it's the, the impact in the, bus, the budget will be absolutely uh, important. The, dramatic. So if we come to this uh, very well-known uh, uh, slide about uh, the, what is the definition of sustainability for the biosimilars marketplace, we see that it's a multifactorial uh, thing and should be uh, addressed uh, this way. I mean, uh, we cannot use only think about the patients or only think about the physician choice or only think about the quality. Uh, of course, safe and quality is probably the a mandatory thing here, but we have to also think about the, uh, all the kind of all the stakeholders and for sure the healthcare budgets that otherwise can put in danger the rest of the system. So, in Europe, in most cases, uh, we have to say that the, the tenders has is really the solution that most of the of the government or all the governments have uh, put in place to to, uh, to ensure that the but that it is, this is going to work. Uh, I would just only uh, refer to the last part. Or the aim of the tendering is to ensure the necessary products at the required cost with the right quality and quantities. This is what is expected. And it should be done by making the process transparent and uh, trying to give uh, the same opportunities to all the other players. Otherwise, the system will not be sustainable in the future. So here is an important question that I would like to, to, to raise here, and also it's going to be tried to be solved in the in the forthcoming uh, slides. That is, can we talk about uh, added value or value added services, uh, or should be only uh, focusing on the on the price? As we will see. Uh, there are many divergences between uh, countries in the implementation and in the, uh, even in the definition of what is a, a valid added services. This is a, cr a crucial thing because if, if, um, if the only concept that is going to matter is, uh, is price, uh, probably the promotional investments, all the, all the in general investments for the, for the companies in biosimilar uh, arena, will be totally different than if they can somehow um, sell uh, other concepts like it could be uh, supply guarantee, uh, uh, value added services, education, or patient support, for example. So the first question is to decide, uh, to, to define what are the pros and cons of um, considering the added value uh, services in the tender process. The first is the pros. Of course, this provides more therapeutic option to doctors and patients. And uh, it's possible this, through this uh, BAS that can, can be generated more uh, interest, more improvement in all the uh, value chain. However, we also shouldn't forget uh, that this reduces standardization and the tender system is normally very well established. Also, if we don't have a very clear uh, and harmonized uh, criteria, uh, it will be difficult that uh, it can be uh, 
skipped the level of transparency that the tenders requires. And of course, this can affect also to the price redu reduction that are really uh, what most of the, in most of cases, uh, these, the payers are expecting to get. Well, uh, we, there are some examples uh, of uh, tenders that have been used in uh, some BAS uh, uh, criteria, but again, depends on the camp, it's a more or less in a very specific uh, markets and a very specific situations and without a, a complete um, unharmonized uh, system. Another important thing is that uh, many markets, many, many countries, I, mean, I, I could say almost all of them, they have uh, this, uh, these elements in their, in their guidelines. I mean, they, they put in the guidelines. However, when they have to, to prepare the, the tender it themselves, uh, it's not clear that, that the, this theoretically uh, interest in, the, in promoting this added value uh, is uh, written anywhere. So, so we have seen this, 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 guy, this example, and also we have in England that's also, they are also trying to, to find a way uh, to, um, to consider all the elements uh, interested in, interesting in this, in this part. But let's go directly to the, to the tenter process. How, it, how is the real uh, work, for example, in Spain? In Spain, there are 27 regional administrations that are called Comunidades Autonomas. All of them, they have the possibility to work uh, autonomously However, most of them are, are uh, organized uh, in trusts to gain uh, bargain uh, negotiation capacity. Uh, what is normally happens is that there are like a big frame agreements uh, that, is, that are called ag Acuerdos Marcos that are uh, with the average duration of two years. Uh, the winners are entitled to, to participate in a, limit, in a very limited uh, tendering process that is uh, coming afterwards that can be uh, even at hospital level. So, but uh, this is, a, let's say, a, somehow a multi-winner approach. I mean, normally there are three companies that can uh, be into this uh, Acuerdo Marco. Uh, however, the prices used to be 80% or even more of the purchase decision. Why? Because uh, although you see the, the guidelines of the tenders, uh, they say that maybe technical reasons can be 40%, but, that, but in, at all, these technical reasons are, uh, are met by all the participants in the tender, otherwise they could not uh, participate. So at the end, it's a, mat it's a pure mat matter of, uh, of, of pricing. Um, what is quite important, and because we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but now it makes a big difference, is that there are uh, tenders where are this, um, solving a separate way for patients, for naive patients or treated patients. So uh, that allows the innovator to keep their market share uh, in, the, in, the, in the old patients, but allows the, the new one, newcomers, the bio, uh, biosimilars to, to attach the other part of the, of the market. The, the situation in Italy is very similar. There are 20 regions. And what is interesting here is that uh, as the doctor should have always the, the access to all the possible arsenal, that means that even if the tenders have been lost, um, the hospital are purchasing other products. So uh, is this, is this is not exactly a winner takes all business in the sense that the, the losers cannot have their products in the hospital, but obviously uh, there's uh, anyway, the, the winner is the, the most prescribed product in this case. In the US, uh, also we have four regions, uh, plus Scotland, Wales, and North uh, Ireland, and ev uh, every one of them, they have their own tenders. All of them are framework agreements. Another important thing that we have to, to consider when uh, discussing about tenders and this system for, for the sustainability and the adoption of biosimilars is uh, which kind of uh, impact has uh, tenders in uh, the adoption of biosimilars. Here we have four these different models uh, and uh, what can be seen the first, the first uh, good lesson or the first takeaway that we have is the uh, single winner, take, uh, the winner takes all uh, is by far, by far the, or creates immediately the early adoption of biosimilars. I mean, this is, if you compare, for example, between Denmark and France here, the adoption of, in one case is quite fast and the other one is quite slow. Also, uh, we consider uh, 
the time to market uh, of the different countries uh, about biosimilars, we, we see like uh, systems like uh, Norway or Denmark that are very quite, quite tender oriented are also the first adopters of the biosimilars uh, and even uh, in some cases faster, much, first, much faster than the original product. So these are some ideas. Um, just to discuss something very simple. Should be uh, or will be tenders are just price-driven business or we can expect another kind of approach. Uh, and a second very important question is, um, is sustainable uh, or just winner takes all strategy in the long term? And I would say the third one is a more pragmatic one is, okay, imagine that we discussed that the, the, the just price-driven business model is not the right one or not the ideal one. Uh, and the winner takes all strategy is not uh, the right one for the long term. Does it matter? I mean, uh, the, the present decision makers are going to follow these two guidelines and try to change the, the, the system, or uh, the short term uh, strategies will, uh, will be the last uh, to be adopted. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, article uh, that I, I recommend you to, to write. I, I try to address what has been the, the, the criteria, what is the what has been the role of the BAS uh, at, the, at the present situation in the tendering uh, markets in, in Europe. And um, again, um, they put uh, all, always the, the same uh, question: that is, uh, the need to go on in the in the role of the BAS uh, to understand um, if it makes sense to put it. But at the moment, at the moment. Most of the most of the process don't have uh, this BIS into consideration. Uh, that is that means that uh, again, from a pragmatical point of view, the governments are more interested to save money at the moment than any other question. These are the conclusions of the EQ via report that were uh, referred by my colleague uh, the, the Eduardo previously. Uh, the first of all is that um, the environment is neutral or positive. The second important thing, uh, the top two areas that uh, pose a risk in sustainability are uh, the patient driven switch and the gender system. Uh, sorry, the payer drivers switch. I mean, uh, if the payer are going to make the decision uh, at 100%, uh, and we they implement the gender system, it will be uh, trying to get the maximum reduction of prices the, the fastest possible and probably uh, coming as soon as possible. And this is uh, definitely, uh, these single winner tenders are going to, to be very, very effective on the short term. That's clearly because it's very similar to what happened in the, in the generics in the past. However, this is not, or should not be the long-term uh, system. Uh, this should be, uh, we should put the, the key, the milestones of the future of this, and I agree, with this, uh, with, uh, with this approach, we should create a positive incentive to promote bio biosimilars, that's clear, uh, but we should be sure that the physician retains some uh, prescription freedom in order to, be, to offer the best selection. And we should assign tenders uh, with a multi multiple winners uh, criteria. This way we can uh, keep the, the system uh, working in the, not only the first years, but uh, in the future. Let's go to, to review also tenders and price erosion. This is a model that we have built uh, based on what happens in some cases in generics and can, what can happen also in the biosimilars if, um, if, we, if, I, if only a sharp, uh, sorry, uh, the winner takes all uh, uh, strategy is implemented. Normally, the, but the, when it happens, uh, the first effect is very clear in just one, two, three period, the prices go down, absolutely. But here, uh, many companies cannot, simply cannot sustain uh, this, this, this strategy where uh, they are putting all the resources, they're registering the, pro the projects, uh, the, pro the products, and they attend the, the, the tender, and the tender is lost, and then they, they, they have to say bye-bye for two years. This is not sustainable for many of the companies. So they start to quit out, quit out the, of the market, and after uh, the, the remaining companies start to rise the prices again. So this is something that in the, in the long term is not uh, probably the ideal way. However, is what uh, all this area, all, all these areas, the, 
the savings that produce in the for the payers. So that's why absolutely we can imagine that uh, this is more or less what they are expecting from from the value similars. Uh, here we have uh, some examples of uh, the, the erosion of prices in the cases of uh, a biosimilar uh, product that has been long time in the market, like it has been with field grass team. As we see at the moment, the prices of field grass team are only 8% of the original prices. We have to say also that it has been a long way since then. So I can, I can in, it's very understandable that in the, in the long term, long term uh, probably if the number of, of uh, biosimilars grows, uh, we are going to, to see uh, big uh, reductions in the prices. Um, in, the, in this other graph, we can see that um, comparing generics and biosimilars, uh, we can see can still, although there is an important erosion, uh, this is coming also from Spanish Spanish market and the real market, not the listed market, the real uh, the, the data taken from the from the, the, the tenders okay, that I published. So you see uh, that still the biosimilars are in a better situation than the similar uh, or generics launched in the same or similar uh, time. However, we don't know this is, uh, if this is something that is sustainable as far as the switching and uh, as far as the tender is, uh, start to be more flexible with the, with the, with the conditions to newcomers uh, to come, uh, newcomers to market. Okay. This is also um, try to show what, what happens when, uh, when comers, uh, new companies come to the market. Of course, this is a, a simulation and it's based on our, our experience as it's not very um, precise, but if, uh, I think it provides an inf interesting information that can be uh, also uh, shared. If the original price is 100%, and the first biosimilar to come uh, usually can represent a re reduction of 20, 30%. In some cases, for example, very recently we saw that in Turkey, the first biosimilar only re got reduction of just 5%, but it was uh, just only for two years, and after that, the prices, uh, the newcomers uh, in, uh, increase the pressure on the prices and then after everything uh, happened. Uh, there's also important to say that biosimilars not only provide a, a lower price themselves, but they force the reduction of the original price. For example, in the, this uh, example in Turkey, uh, it's true that only uh, biosimilar were only uh, getting were only 5% cheaper than the originals, but the originals reduced their prices by 25%. So altogether it was nearly 30%. When there are three, four biosimilars, price can go on a, to a 20, 40% of the original price. And, and this is the case where it's quite, uh, quite difficult to survive within, um, uh, for most of the companies when the prices go uh, to uh, less than less than 10%. Uh, uh, just an example of generics very, very recent is, um, as I mentioned before, um, the price of um, imatinib has been the uh, first uh, generic in the market with less than 33% of the original. That's really, really low. We can expect uh, this from the biosimilars. At the moment, it's not clear. But if we go, for example, to uh, the, the example of uh, Humira, uh, we know that at least 31 companies developing Humira biosimilars in the market. So it's go going to be very different, difficult that if most of these companies come to the market, prices can keep uh, at a reasonable level of price. So let's come to the, to the moment where there is a decision uh, to be made. That is uh, in a tender process, uh, the uh, responsible for the company that's tried to apply to this tender has to decide what is the bidding price it will offer. If we are in a winner's takes all uh, environment, of course, this, this, this person uh, will try to with the lowest possible price because it's the only way. If not, you have to stay two years without any sales on this, uh, in this tender. That is quite, quite long. And normally, yeah, after some experiences like that, finally he can decide to quit. In a multi multiple winners uh, environment, uh, probably uh, in the rank of prices that have to be discussed, they will try to, to, to establish themselves in the middle. 
because uh, even if they, they lose, they have opportunities. There is going to be more than, than one option. Of course, the number of tenders uh, is also important. Normally, these companies are have enough products as, to, as to, 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 to be able to attend to different tenders during the years and for, for sure many, many other uh, products, not only one, one of them. But anyway, uh, again, uh, sustainability is also uh, very linked with the possibility to, to keep players uh, in the market. Of course, uh, payers need uh, to get the, the savings, but also the, the companies that are manufacturing and developing the biosimilars require to have at least uh, some kind of, um, of guarantees that the system will be sustainable. So as takeaways, uh, the first question is that uh, we are far in Europe to be a, uni a uniform market or homogeneous market. Uh, still, uh, we have to talk about Germany, France, uh, Italy, UK, Spain, although the trend is clearly going to um, to the to an harmonization and in the way of purchasing very expensive products and all these products are in this category. It's true that the VAS could play an important role. However, at the moment, uh, this is not what the uh, Europeans, uh, European health authorities are looking for. I mean, the role that I'm expecting at the moment is, is uh, the sim a similar one that it has been with generics. Uh, but it should be also, probably also the, the, the payers are learning from the, the past uh, experiences and there's uh, some problems, uh, deliberate problems they are having with some generics and some uh, issues regarding quality. When you push too much the margins in these products, uh, you can find that uh, at the end, uh, you cannot uh, keep it uh, working uh, in the long term. And finally, uh, we have to consider what is the effect uh, that the COVID can have in all this, uh, this, city, this really complex environment. As most of the, the European markets are, are countries are facing a big crisis very soon and we are immersed in a very, very big crisis. So that's, that's more or less what, uh, what my presentation was about. And this is the open question that I always uh, put in my post. This is, is this the future of the, gener of the generics, just the, the, of the biosimilars to, to follow up generics? Well, I have uh, now a good moment to, to know if there is any question from the audience uh, before closing the, this part of the presentation about uh, Europe. Uh, I don't know if anyone has uh, something I can send to, to me and I will answer uh, Happily. The question is, uh, how are companies currently assessing biosimilar investments given the increasing number of companies targeting this space and a fair degree of price erosion on biosimilars? Yes, um, so maybe um, that is a very, very complex uh, question. I think um, uh, what I see is there are different kinds of companies addressing this business. Some of them are pure biosimilar uh, experts and they are using a global approach uh, to be able to to, to be competitive and probably to, to defend themselves from possible uh, uh, problems in specific markets. That's why many of them are looking, for example, for, for emerging markets also, or uh, try to make it global business. Uh, other companies uh, are more maybe focused on a therapeutic area, for example, oncology, and uh, they just add their biosimilars to the rest of their portfolio. As in for some companies like, for example, uh, Accord, they have a very broad portfolio in, in oncology. So they will add the biosimilars they bring into the same portfolio, and probably they have more opportunities as they are treating all the all the structure, all the all the products uh, as a whole or a, with a portfolio strategy, not a specifically by a biosimilar strategy. In, in fact, I think it's uh, also some of, some companies are guessing what is the best approach. Uh, I have no no answer at the moment. Uh, there is a risk, uh, my, in my opinion, uh, until maybe 30%, 40% of the, of, the, um, of the original price, I mean, uh, an erosion of 70, 60, 70% is, um, could be manageable, manageable. but less uh, than 10% price with the, with the cost uh, involved in the biosimilars development 
will make it very very difficult. So uh, I think it's very important the selection of the of the of the the, the, the right target of the products. Uh, probably uh, products like uh, Adalimumab or Tanercept are quite interested for the first comers, but in the midterm they're going to be very very crowded. However, there are uh, 72 products that are going to be uh, in the biosimilar arena in the next five years, considering those that have biosimilars at the moment and those that are going to have a dual the patent uh, soon. And all together, there is a path to find the right, uh, the right products to, to select. For myself, um, I see a two way uh, for the company to try to mitigate uh, their risk of investment because we, we know that still a biosimilar cost uh, a dozen of millions uh, or even hundreds of millions uh, sometimes. So uh, I see two ways. Uh, uh, they, they are taking more attention to a market like us in Asia because, of course, as I mentioned to you, the, 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 regu the, the size is not there yet, but the price are still uh, okay. And there are many markets where you have a free competition. So uh, it's not like, uh, as you show, uh, Ignacio, Europe with huge volume, but with a, a very strong, uh, a very strong uh, price uh, war. And then uh, at the end, it's like Darwin rules, you know, only few are, are, are alive. Uh, so they, they, they come to see us again to dis discuss. Uh, and of course, uh, one point you mentioned already is uh, they are carefully targeting uh, products where they there is a none or very few competition in the future. So what we see right now is people really talking about product that they will be a, a end of a data exclusivity and pattern in 2025, 26 in Europe. So we see people really trying to get out of the red ocean uh, of the current uh, biosimilar to go really with more, uh, more open space. In my case, uh, just to 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 uh, to complement the concept, and, and from the manufacturer and developer perspective, because we are not science are developers, um, we initially we have been working in rituximab and bevacizumab, and it happens what both uh, have mentioned before. So the, the market has been crowded, and sometimes for some some companies, the the choice of or, or choosing a biosimilar, uh, which is really very crowded, is not an option because the investment has to be quite high. But what we have decided recently or some, some years back is to focus our efforts in developing biosimilar that have still not uh, a lot of competition. And if you go through our pipeline, and we are just working in uh, denosumab and palivizumab, which are products that for the moment that are not overcrowded. Um, when we started developing Adalimumab, we understood that there were 16, 17 products that were currently under development. And additionally, the innovator has been reducing the price in approximately 70 to 80%. So I think that um, we, had, uh, as a company which is focused on development, we have put our efforts in, in, in investing in products that add much more uh, with less competition. And, and of course, uh, also, for appointing a partner, it depends on the or their, the rest of the of the basket or the portfolio that the, uh, each company has. Uh, additionally, there are some local local regulations, like in Brazil, like in Mexico, that endorses or supports or foster local production. So, invest investment, investment should be done. But uh, from a business perspective, uh, we usually partner with companies that have been evaluating the the market. And, and putting our efforts in biosimilar that has uh, not so many competition for the time being. Yes, uh, that's what's uh, exactly what I think about it. Uh, okay, so um, I think it's, it's time. We are right. Uh, it was supposed to be one hour and a half, and uh, I think we are exactly in the time. I don't know if you have any any other question. Otherwise, we can we can finish this, this uh, presentation. I will say again, many thanks to both of you for your, your interesting speech. And I'm sure we will be keeping in touch because these are some areas of collaboration that we can find. Uh, Philippe, thank you very much. Uh, Eduardo, thank Philippe, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, Pharma Synergy team as well. It was an amazing session. and. Uh, uh, we wish you a nice uh, afternoon one-to-one uh, -one meetings, uh, which are still running until 8 p.m. London. And thank you very much for joining.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.